Good evening, everyone. We're on uh, session nine of the Color of Compromise, uh, a continuing study by uh, Dr. Tisdale having to do with um, how the Christian church has been part of a conspiracy, not intentional, but uh, nonetheless um, very real on the matter of uh, racism in the United States. And uh, he made some very good points along the way thus far, and uh, we expect that that will be the case again this evening as he's moving into a more modern day understanding of the practice of, um, of racism and how it, um, it gets a little bit more subtle and uh, he'll have uh, ways to explain that. But before we begin, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that you've called us to be lifelong learners. And on the things that matter most, we have to confess there is much we do not know. And so we have given ourselves to this study in the hopes that uh, we would come to know more of uh, our nation's background and why it is that racism continues to raise its head as um, we try our best to make our way into the future. We pray for the church and ask, oh God, that you would show us the ways in which we fall into error with regard to this matter of social justice, but also teach us, teach us not only how we have fallen into error, but what we must do to correct it. Help us, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> um, by the way, uh, with regard to the prayer, um, uh, Tisdale has written um, another book. And I've seen that uh, <clears throat> right now media, which is what we subscribe to as a church and where this, this uh, comes from, um, that is uh, now available. And it has to do with the business of correcting racism. So that may be something we want to follow up with. I have to investigate it a little more thoroughly. I, I don't know much about it. I just saw it tonight before as I was getting on. So um, perhaps we can uh, take a look at it um, and uh, see whether it's something you want to do on a continuing basis. Okay, so I'll do a share screen. Make sure the sound is on. And here we go. Political operative Lee Atwater said he had two great aims in life, to manage a presidential campaign and to be the chairman of his party. He achieved both of those goals by the age of 40. He was a Republican operative who worked on George H.W. Bush's campaign and earlier had worked in the Reagan White House as an advisor. He was known for his shrewd tactics and sometimes brutal political ad campaigns. But he made an admission. Shortly before his untimely death in 1991 because of a brain tumor, he said, you start out in 1954 saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts you. It backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff, and you're getting so abstract. Atwater went on to explain, now you're talking about cutting taxes and all the things you're talking about are totally economic things and a byproduct of them is black people get hurt worse than whites. What Lee Atwater is encompassing in those statements is the idea of colorblind conservatism. One of the themes as we study U.S. race and racism is that racism never goes away, it just adapts. So in colorblind conservatism, you don't use explicitly race-based language. You claim that you don't see color, so you don't say black or white in the laws. But you still end up supporting social and political policies that adversely harm racial and ethnic minorities. This section, I wanna talk about the rise of the so-called religious right. We're covering the period from the 1960s through the 1980s, and it's a time when political conservatives helped coalesce certain Christians into a political force that every major Republican political official had to court if they wanted to have lasting success. 
Now, neither Democrats nor the GOP adequately address racism. Neither party is free from it, but one party has set itself up as the party for, quote, real Christians and evangelicals. Now, let me say this from the outset. I thought in my experience that talking about racism would be the most controversial thing I could do among evangelicals, but I was wrong. It's talking about politics and racism. And so let me say from the start that this is not about anyone becoming a Democrat or a Republican or switching parties. I think we need faithful Christians in both parties, but we need faithful Christians being Christian where they are, which means calling out the bigotry and racism and prejudice that may arise from whomever or whichever party. Now, when we're talking about the rise of the religious right, politics became a proxy for racial conflict. And that conflict translated into divisions in the church. In the late 20th century, evangelicalism becomes a national movement. So in 1976, a Newsweek article proclaimed it the year of the evangelical. It's about this time that Jimmy Carter becomes the first openly born again president. It's 1980 that Rick Warren establishes Saddleback Church as one of the first and premier mega churches in the U.S. It's the popularity of Hal Lindsey's book on the end times called The Late Great Planet Earth, which sold 28 million copies. What is an evangelical? Now, historians have spilled plenty of ink trying to tackle this question and define evangelicalism. One frequent reference point, which has its drawbacks but is helpful to start, is called Bebbington's Quadrilateral, meaning four, four sides. The first is conversionism. Evangelicals place an emphasis on a personal decision to follow Jesus. The second is biblicism, which interprets miracles as true and scripture as divinely inspired. It's a supernatural book. The third is crucicentrism, crucicentrism, which is a focus on the crucifixion and Christ's sacrifice. And then number four is activism, which means an engaged faith, one that doesn't retreat from the world, but somehow speaks to it. Now, there's something called the politicization of evangelicalism, this melding of evangelical Christian beliefs and politics. Historian Kristen Dumay says, it seems reasonable to assume that when Americans self-identify as evangelicals today, many of them are identifying with the movement as it has taken shape in recent decades, a conservative, politicized movement. So we got to look, we got to probe this connection between evangelicalism and politics. Again, racism never goes away, it just adapts. Racism didn't end with the Civil Rights Movement or with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Fair Housing Act of 1968. 400 years of oppression and white supremacy does not disappear with the stroke of a pen or the passage of just a few years. Now, Racism was easier to detect in the past. So this is one of the things that we have to be conscious of. Racism in the 21st century and even at the end of the 20th century, it's more subtle. But still, as subtle as it may be, Christian complicity remains. So we have to think about the role of white theological conservatives when it comes to the Republican Party. This is not an argument to switch parties or to say one party is better than another, but there is one particular party that has portrayed itself as the party that is friendly to white evangelicals. And within these parties, we need to be courageous about confronting racism wherever it may appear. In another segment, we talked about law and order politics. Billy Graham and the urban uprising and this rhetoric around keeping the order and people following the laws in opposition to urban uprisings, which were in many ways breaking the laws, but doing so, as King said, as a language of the unheard. Now, one of the politicians who popularized law and order politics was Richard Nixon. Billy Graham and Richard Nixon became fast friends. In one letter from Graham to Nixon, he said, anytime you have a few days this winter, we can take a swim or go play a game of golf in Florida or better still in Hawaii. 
Now, Graham had been affiliated with presidents throughout his career, but he was close friends with Nixon. Graham even gave Nixon advice on when Nixon was deciding whether to run for president and said, listen, if you don't, you'll always wonder if you could have won. And so he did. Nixon ran and he won. And in his first election, he won 68% of the white evangelical vote. In his re-election, he won 84% of the white evangelical vote. Now, what is the appeal? It came partly from this idea of law and order politics. Again, it's a response to uprisings in urban areas. It's a response to the black power movement, which is advocating for more self-determination and independence among black people. He said that the seeds of anarchy were nurtured by scores of respected Americans, including public officials, educators, clergymen, and civil rights leaders as well. He went on to say, I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. Law and order rhetoric fueled an increasingly punitive criminal justice system so that nowadays people talk about the crisis of mass incarceration. Think about this. The U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of its incarcerated persons. There are harsher sentences. There are undercover police squads that go in and raid inner city communities. There are financial incentives to building prisons. This is all part of what some historians have called the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy tapped into an emerging sense of white middle-class suburban identity. There was this, as Nixon said, great silent majority of Americans who were sick of the rioting and of the social upheaval of the civil rights movement. And so the Southern strategy focused on mobilizing white people, not just in the South, but in the Sun Belt. What is the Sun Belt? It's an area that stretches across the United States in cities like Dallas and Orange County, California, Phoenix, Arizona, and many other places. It's a sense of identity as much as it is a geographic place. Fiscally and socially conservative voters, the type that might be attracted to folks like George Wallace in 1968 who ran for president, they focus on ideals like free market capitalism, meritocratic individualism, and the idea of America as a Christian nation. So when Graham first came to prominence early on in, in the 1950s in his crusades, he gave a sermon in California and he said, I feel more at home here than any place I've ever been. Now, Graham is from North Carolina, but he's in California and feels at home because of this ethos of the Sun Belt. Now, this all sort of coalesces when Nixon runs for president. It's the first time that Billy Graham ever endorses a person as president in a campaign. And he tells Nixon, he says, evangelicals could promote the president's vision of law and order. There's that phrase again. H.R. Haldeman, a Nixon advisor, said, the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing so. That's how this phrase and this rhetoric of law and order functioned. It subtly imported a racist idea that black people were still really the problem, but it did so in a language that didn't use explicitly race-based language. Like I said, racism never goes away. It just adapts. All the American church really needs to do in terms of compromise is cooperate with already established racially unequal social systems. Nowadays, when people think of the religious right or organizations like the moral majority, the first thing people think about is abortion, that these are pro-life groups. And it seems like abortion was really the reason for being for all of these groups and the reason that all of these conservative Christians mobilized around a particular party. The reality though, is that abortion was not the first unifying issue of the religious right. In fact, early on, theologically conservative Christians didn't necessarily have a very clear pro-life stance. W.A. Criswell, who's come up a few times in our talk about race in the American church, said, I have always felt that it was only after a child was born and had life separate from its mother that it became an individual person. The reality is that many Protestants saw abortion as mostly a Catholic issue and didn't take strong stances on it till late in the 20th century. 
So if it wasn't abortion that coalesced the religious right and the moral majority, then what was it? Well, to understand that, we have to look at Bob Jones University. This was a university started in 1927 under Bob Jones, who was a famous pastor and evangelist. Historian Randall Balmer looks at BJU and how the IRS cracked down on the university because the university prevented interracial dating. One of the officials at Bob Jones University said there are three basic races, Oriental, Caucasian, and Negroid. At Bob Jones University, everybody dates within those races, and anyone involved in an interracial relationship or who promoted such pairings would face expulsion. In view of their stances on race, the IRS revoked tax-exempt status in 1976, but Bob Jones University argued that segregation was a sincerely held religious belief and thus that the government was interfering with the practice of religion. It was only in 2008, the 21st century, that the university officially repudiated its stance. We conformed to the culture rather than providing a clear counterpoint to it. I appreciate this person's comments because he's speaking to the idea of complicity. Rather than countering the culture and the racist status quo of the university's previous presidents and the broader society at large, Bob Jones University in many ways went along with the culture in terms of compromise and complicity in racism. But the story of Bob Jones University doesn't end there. Paul Weyrich, a political analyst, said what galvanized the Christian community was not abortion, school prayer, or the Equal Rights Amendment. What changed their minds was Jimmy Carter's intervention against the Christian school, trying to deny them tax-exempt status on the basis of so-called de facto segregation. You see, many Christians saw what the IRS did in regard to Bob Jones University as the federal government coming after Christian schools and abridging their freedom of religion. And that is what Paul Weyrich and others have said is what originally coalesced the religious right and what eventually became an organization called the Moral Majority. One of the leaders of the Moral Majority is a man named Jerry Falwell. In the mid-1960s, he took a particular stance on the idea of pastors or Christians getting involved in civil rights. He preached a sermon called Ministers and Marches, in which he said, preachers are not called to be politicians, but soul winners. Again and again in our study of U.S. history and race, we see this separation between the so-called gospel and the call to evangelize and convert people and social and political change. In other traditions, say the black church tradition, those two have not been starkly separated and people have seen it as part of the central core of the gospel to work for justice in the broader world. Now, that was in the 1960s when Falwell said this. By 1976, he had completely changed his tune. He was doing a tour called the I Love America Rally Tour. And it was the 4th of July. And in his message, he said this, this idea of religion and politics don't mix was invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own country. Quite the switch from what he said a scant 10 years or so before. Now, in 1979, Falwell forms the Moral Majority Incorporated. He does so in a meeting with other political and religious operatives, and he's trying to figure out how to gather a coalition of Christians that would form a political force for conservatism and they chose the name Moral Majority. And in Falwell's words, it was pro-life, pro-family, pro-moral, and pro-America. This organization helped to formalize a shift that had been taking place for decades. Didn't create it, but it gave a framework for the politicization of evangelicalism. And it included really not just evangelicals, but also Mormons, Jews, and Catholics. It grew. It had a $6 million budget within a couple of years. The Moral Majority Report, its institutional communication arm, went to 840,000 households. So it was very popular among a segment of the American society. The Moral Majority was also a strong supporter of President Ronald Reagan. 
Now, Reagan is still today by many people seen as the epitome of the Republican Party and a hero among both political and Christian conservatives. At a rally at First Baptist Dallas, W.A. Criswell's church, in 1980, Ronald Reagan said, I know this is a nonpartisan gathering. This is a room full of white evangelicals. And he said, so I know you can't endorse me, but I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. Well, of course, evangelicals at this point fell in love with this man and his rhetoric and the sense that he was for them. He was for Christian America. He was for a white evangelical vision of America. So they voted for him in droves. When he was elected in November of 1980, Jerry Falwell, who was heading the moral majority, called it my finest hour. So again, the point's not to push Christians toward any particular political party. The goal here is to probe how our political allegiances specifically impact race relations. The religious right compromised with racism by failing to support civil rights legislation and alternatively by supporting policies that adversely and disproportionately impacted black people. There are these pernicious ideas in the political realm about welfare and welfare queens and crime that is focused among black people. These ideas that lead to issues such as mass incarceration. There's also this issue that capitalism is somehow the only Christian way to think about economics. In fact, Jerry Falwell said in his book, Listen America, the free enterprise system is outlined in the book of Proverbs. Over time, Black people have voted less and less for Republican candidates or their policies, while white evangelical support remains strong. In fact, it's the highest of any religious demographic group. And we've got to probe that. We've got to ask why are black and white people generally and black and white Christians in particular voting so differently? What is it about the platforms of each party that appeals so differently to these different groups along racial lines? There are always unintended consequences of our political choices, bad things that happen as a result of things that we did support. We can't completely plan for that, but Christians do have the responsibility to consider how our political allegiances attach themselves and either support or deny racial justice. In particular, we need to look at this marriage between evangelicalism and conservative politics and the ways that particular policies may have, even inadvertently, supported racial inequality. Uh, is this timely or what? <laughs> um, you know, we see we see uh, all of this uh, change in voting practices going on uh, in Georgia and uh, Texas now is presenting its stuff and uh, Arizona and uh, Pennsylvania is on its way and we'll be hearing about that before long. I'm absolutely confident. But uh, notice that uh, uh, when when quizzed about it, they do not approach it with the language that it it has racism attached to it or is a return to Jim Crow in any way, uh, but rather they talk about it. Well, well, you tell me, how do they, how do they talk about it? Election integrity. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, you know, all the experts have said this has been the most um, carefully watched uh, and, and, uh, uh, fairest election that was ever held in the United States. And all of, we're getting a bunch of noise uh, about election integrity uh, based on what amounts to a, a lie. Uh, so I, we could, you know, but it's another example of what this, what Tisby is talking about. That, that, uh, there's, uh, there seems to be movement in, uh, in this area and that racism how does he say it? <clears throat> Racism doesn't go away. It just does what? Adapts. Adapts. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> just adapts. And changes its terminology. 
uh, which is which is very fascinating. Um, when uh, we look back at what we've seen so far in in the long course of the series, uh, when when the Civil War was over, uh, the South uh, was not Republican by any stretch. Uh, it was mostly Democrat because everyone uh, felt as though the Republican uh, Abraham Lincoln wow. had brought on this war. And so, uh, and, and anything that the Republicans were trying to do in Reconstruction was against the South. And so we have, we have South being wildly democratic and now it has shifted completely. And uh, uh, Tis, uh, Tisby suggests that this really has its origins in, um, in the, uh, uh, the uh, campaign of Richard Nixon. Um, and uh, what, what happened in the midst of that campaign with regard to um, you know, what, what was going on among faith-based organizations. So uh, let's, let's uh, work that through a little bit. Um, uh, all of us have lived through the rise of the religious right. Um, and we have uh, seen that happen. Uh, it's mainly gone by two terms. Um, first of all, evangelicalism. And then after that, it became the moral majority. Now it's back to uh, the evangelical uh, movement and uh, it's left the moral majority concept behind. Um, but uh, he referenced the uh, uh, Bebbington uh, quadrilateral. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't familiar with that. So I jumped on, uh, on it and uh, thought I'd present that to you in a little more detail. Uh, the first thing that we'll do is uh, hold steady here. Um, here is the uh, Bebbington. Note. I didn't want to do that. Hang on here. I want to. I want to uh, hold steady. There. There it is. This is a uh, this is an educational device. We're doing the uh, a little quiz on the Bebbington quadrilateral. If I make you take this quiz, you'll remember it more carefully. And so, uh, here we go. What is Bebbington's quadrilateral? And uh, here it is. Four part definition of evangelicalism. Uh, by the way, uh, this was developed in the 70s, and so there are many people, and, and I'll show you an article with regard to that, who believe that this is uh, severely outdated. Um, so uh, we'll move on to the next quiz. What is Biblicism? It is a particular regard for the Bible and all essential spiritual truth is to be found on the pages of scripture. Anyone disagree with that? The key here for me is essential spiritual truth. I don't disagree with that. I, I embrace that as a, a reasonable definition. And if so, if so, then I, you can call me a biblicist. Where I begin to run into trouble is with regard to the inerrancy factor. And um, I believe that uh, if you read the Bible uh, literally, uh, you're going to be subject to error. Um, and I have a whole lecture on that if you want to hear it someday about what it means to think like a Hebrew, uh, how we have distorted the scriptures by our Western worldview. But uh, I don't have any trouble with this statement about, uh, about biblicism. Questions about that? The word all. Uh, there, there's no uh, spiritual truth outside of the Bible? Um, I think what they would say in response to that, David, is if the spiritual truth you're defining is in concert with the Bible, I think they would embrace that as, as being true. Is, is, is that do you understand what I'm saying? If if you find a spiritual truth outside of Scripture, uh, wh whether you're reading someone else, um, uh, and and you come across that, and if that 
if that position agrees with scripture, then yes, it's to be embraced. I think it can be embraced. I don't know if you have an example in mind. No, I don't. It's just the word all was. I had a friend un unsettled. Uh -huh. I had a friend a long time ago who did not believe in dinosaurs. They didn't believe that there were ever dinosaurs. And I believe they said one time that if dinosaurs were real, they would have been in the Bible. Yeah, well, uh, I have an interesting little uh, story about that. Uh, uh, Kathy and I were in the Grand Canyon. Uh, this was uh, the early 80s, I think, 1983, uh, when we were first there for our first time. And um, we were taking a... a a, uh, a tour uh, led by the ranger uh, down into the canyon over over top of the uh, the edge of the canyon and we took a trail down below and and um, something that the ranger pointed out that we would have missed just because we're not aware of things is uh, 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 dinosaur tracks and um, so uh, you know he was giving us his uh, his uh, spiel on that how old they are and and how how preserved they were by the sediments of this uh, this this landscape that had been there for ages and ages, and it happened that we had a woman who was a creationist on the uh, the same tour, the same ranger uh, lecture, and uh, she said, "Well, I don't I don't believe that to be true," and so uh, the uh, Ranger, of course, asked what, you know, what she meant. She said, well, I'm a creationist and I believe that the, the earth is only 6,000 years old. And uh, that's, that's according to biblical history. And so I believe that the, I believe that the dinosaurs, um, this dinosaur, in fact, was probably killed by the flood. And what we have here is, is much, much younger than what you are representing in your lecture. <laughs> Um, so uh, maybe that's a good example, David, of all essential spiritual truth. If, if one goes to the uh, extent of, of uh, using scripture for your scientific base of knowledge, it will be proven again and again to be um, impossible to interpret that way. Uh, the, the Bible is not meant to be a scientific. It's a, it's a place, a depository for spiritual truth. And so we cannot be we cannot be imposing. Our, see, our Western frame of mind. And this is getting into the lecture now. Our Western frame of mind likes to impose on Scripture the 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 idea that it, if 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 I can't depend upon it for for this truth, then I can't depend upon it for any truth. And the Hebrew people, particularly out of the Old Testament, because that's where this woman was was dealing from. Hebrew people look at Christians who are interpreting scripture like that and say, you must be nuts. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the way it's, it's, it's supposed to be handled. Uh, scripture is a depository for truth. Now, um, you know, what, uh, so what do we do? Let me, give this, let me just give some examples. This has nothing to do with racism, but it has everything to do, well, it gets into racism because it has to do with interpretation of scripture. And, and how things work. So what do we do with the first creation story in Genesis chapter one? What's our, what's our major, major uh, issue with that teaching? The earth was created in? Seven days. Well, six days, but yeah, in, yeah, in a week's days. time, the earth was created and he took a rest. So, so uh, right away, the, 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 Hebrew mind is is understanding this that God created all that is. He looked at creation and saw, saw that everything was good, and uh, and when human beings were created, he said it's very good, and then he rested from his labor. Now, um, the Western mind, not the Hebrew mind, but the Western mind, is busy doing something else with that same passage. What is it that you and I, and creationists especially, are trying to trying to figure out? How long is a day? How long is a day? Was this truly a day, 
Or do we go to the Psalms where it reads, a, a, a thousand year are as but a day in your sight, O God. <laughs> uh, you know, how, how do we, we Westerners interpret uh, scripture in, in such a different way? Um, the, the best example, the, the most fun example is, uh, is and the, the place where uh, creationists and biblical literalists get thrown off is, so Adam and Eve have two sons, their names, Cain and Abel. So, so uh, we, have, we have four human beings right now. And so uh, uh, Cain and Abel offer a sacrifice. Abel's sacrifice is accepted. Cain's is put aside. We can talk about why that was, but it's irrelevant because Cain, out of his jealousy, kills his brother Abel. So now the four are down to three and uh, God visits and asks Cain, where is your brother? Uh, just as an aside, uh, Cain, uh, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And of course, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, let me ask you Christians, are you your brother's keeper? Absolutely, we are. <laughs> That's why we're talking about this whole issue. Uh, we are our brothers and sisters keeper. And um, the blood of Abel is crying out from the ground. Uh, Cain finally uh, confesses that he's killed his brother. And then what happens? What does, what does God do? He's banished. He's banished. He's sent away. And right away, this is the this is the, the first clue. Cain says, "What? But what if the others um, do? They'll they'll kill me." And the Western mind is saying, "Wait a minute! I've got three people here. Who are these others?" And so God puts a mark on his head, sends him to the land of Nod. And in the land of Nod, what happens? meets a wife, has <laughs> his family, and the Westerner pulling her hair out saying, wait a minute, I want these details to all line up. This story is going haywire on me. Um, I want these details to all line up. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Cain has a family, and we didn't even know there were other people on earth. And uh, so the way the Westerner views uh, scripture and the way we view script a way we should view scripture in terms of looking for spiritual truth i mean we could go back over the story now and find out what, what's the spiritual truth um and there is a whole host of, of spiritual truths and that's what's important to the hebrew whereas we american we western thinkers we read it like it's a newspaper we want all the facts to line up if this fact doesn't match up with this fact then the whole thing goes goes out the door and so they are working hard these people who believe that there aren't dinosaurs or that uh, the, the dinosaur was running away from the flood when when of noah's flood uh, we uh, they're trying to make sure that the details line up and it's not intended to be that kind of book. Uh, again, I have a whole lecture on all this. One more piece I'll say to you is that um, we, we Westerners have to have, imagine yourself looking at a, uh, a, uh, a tractor trailer, okay? Uh, and you are looking at this tractor trailer and it is on the job of making a delivery. Now, you and I are concerned about the tractor trailer as, as a truck, and it is moving things. And we aren't so concerned about what's inside. We are concerned about will that thing make its destination and deliver the goods. The Hebrew is not interested in the truck at all. The Hebrew is interested in what's the cargo that's being carried. And the same is true of scripture. What is the truth that's being communicated is much more important to the Hebrew than how it is communicated. Make sense? Yeah. A little bit of sense? Uh, someday, if you, if you really insist on it, I'll talk more at length about it. But that's, uh, 
that's a summary of, of what's going on there. But you're quite, <laughs> Patrice, you're quite right. There are people who don't believe yeah. that dinosaurs existed. And there are people who believe that dinosaurs existed, but they're, they're less than 6,000 years old when the scientists are telling us that this is a million year proposition. <laughs> uh, thousands and thousands of years have passed. So, well, that's biblicism. Boy, we, didn't, we went further than I ever thought. Here's the next uh, uh, quizlet, and that is crucicentrism. Crucicentrism. Crucicentrism is a focus on the atoning work of Christ on the cross. Do we have any problem with that one? No, you can't be Christian without understanding that Christ went to the cross in order to die for our sin. And that in that death, we find atonement. We become at one with God. That was the purpose of the cross. It's hard to, hard to disagree with that. Conversionism. This one speaks a little more easily to us. Uh, it's the belief that human beings need to be converted. Now, we might talk about it differently. What would, what would be an, another way or two of talking about the need to be converted? Be saved. Be saved is certainly one way. You can yep. confess your sins and the error of following my plan and Sure. Agreeing yeah. with God and trying to follow his. Yeah, well, certainly, certainly. Um, that's, that's what's behind conversion and, and salvation. Any other? How did Jesus talk about it? Born again. I missed that. Born again. Yeah, you must be born again. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what this conversation with Nicodemus was all about. And so uh, do we have any trouble with that? I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a a basic concept of Christianity that I don't disagree with it. I get it. I understand what's at stake. And then there's activism. Uh, Tisby along the way has said that, um, that uh, typically uh, a lot of people in the pietistic side of, of faith experience miss the idea of working on activism, working out their social justice. But here we have uh, the, what, what this quadrilateral is expressing is a, an embracing of, um, of the idea that the gospel needs to be expressed, that, that uh, we are to be active in our faith practice. The only thing missing here, in my mind, is expressed in effect. What, quite does, that, what does that mean exactly? I think, I think it would be better stated if it, the belief that the gospel needs to be expressed in ways that lead to social justice, that, that show love of neighbor or however language would change. Uh, but uh, so that is uh, the Bebbington quadrilateral and it was presented to you as a little quiz. I'm gonna back out of that and uh, move into this guy uh, is uh, critiquing uh, the quadrilateral. This is an article from 2018. And um, he is questioning the, the notion of evangelicalism and what, what that means in our day. Uh, the Bebbington quadrilateral was, a, as I said, a, a mid to late 70s um, uh, creation, I think 1978. And um, so he, he is he is suggesting, and I believe he's right, that uh, the evangelical quadrilateral has changed um, and it has become much, much more political. And uh, you can see pieces of this article. Human beings self-identify all the time. Democrat, Republican, I'm an environmentalist. I'm a free market capitalist. I'm a Starbucks guy. I'm a Pete's coffee guy. I'm a Dodger fan, Yankee fan, go on and on. Um, and... Uh, the, the notion of uh, uh, David Bebbington is uh, to come up with what most students of evangelical call that quadrilateral, simple, concise formula that seeks to answer the question, what is evangelical Christianity as an identifiable faith movement and community? My reason for putting the quiz up is, frankly, I consider myself an evangelical. I, I believe in those things that are part of that quadrilateral. 
But what I don't believe in, however, is where that has led people. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not gonna put that out here on the rec recorded version, but, but uh, I, I could not um, uh, for, for many reasons consider myself, even though I am a Republican, I, I don't consider myself someone who votes that way. I'm more centrist than and moderate than, than all of that. So uh, this fellow goes on then, and he, he, he works hard to, um, uh, to create a new sense of the uh, quadrilateral. And this is what he believes of, of evangelical Christianity in America is more accurately defined by these, uh, moralism, enforcing their moral convictions on a few select issues, uh, those being abortion and homosexuality. Ethnocentrism, uh, notice how that might speak to Tisby's issues, defending their religious freedom and instituting it as an informal civic religion of the United States, a form of Christianity that strongly reflects a dominant white culture. Authoritarianism, demanding an absolute commitment to those in authority as long as they preserve their moralistic ethnocentric vision of America. Does that sound familiar about anything that uh, we've experienced just lately? <laughs> and consumerism, this is fascinating, enjoying without interruption their distinct brand of crossless, crossless, you know, the, the crucicentrism, cru what do you call it? The, yeah, crucicentrism has cross at the center, consumerism doesn't have the cross. Uh, their distinct brand of crossless consumer Christianity. Uh, there are even uh, um, uh, incidents where uh, churches do not want the cross to be placed in their, in their uh, houses of worship because they, um, they reflect weakness in their minds. So, uh, you know, so we have the Bebbington quadrilateral, and then we have this uh, Kurt Lewis quadrilateral. Which one do you think works in in our current day, 2021? When you say works, you mean which one is active? Which one yes, is a better yes. which definition? one? Which one? Which one would we say better reflects what's going on today? Last one, the real one. Yeah. This yeah. Last. Yeah, so, so when Tisby, um, well, when Tisby mentioned the Bebbington quadrilateral, notice that he said, now there are some problems with it. <laughs> well, there are some major problems. Uh, and uh, he was kind in uh, using those, those words. So since I didn't know anything about the Bebbington quadrilateral, I thought maybe that would be helpful. And to notice, mm -hmm. again, one of the things that becomes clear to us is that Racism does not go away, but it adapts. And notice how this language of evangelicalism, something that I consider myself to be, uh, is now distorted and, and, and has become a, 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 a political uh, um, uh, I, I don't know, movement in and of itself. Um, I remember very clearly the moral majority and how it just disgusted me. I, and that's, you know, it disgusted me not so much because of what it was trying to do, but there were a lot of things that were going on that I didn't consider moral. So um, anyway. Um, well, it, you know, it, Roger... I was thinking about my personal experience. I grew up in a United Methodist Church, and then and we were very ecumenical, you know, community services. No difference between us as Methodists and the Lutherans and the UCC Church, other than you know it was almost like just your group of friends or your family. There was no idea that one was better than another. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it was like the, the whole idea of being ecumenical and we're all one God's church. And then in the 90s, I participated in some evangelical churches and that second 
uh, thing you showed with the four, the four characteristics. They were they were very authoritarian, mm -hmm. and um, you know I've said before things. You know I have a perspective sort of as a feminist, like um, I I don't feel that there's anything biblical that says that women can't participate in any kind of church administration or finance or anything. But of course, many churches, women don't get involved. They don't get near the money mm -hmm. or women don't teach. Women can't teach men, but the men teach the women mm -hmm. and, you know, things like that. All, um, and I, I really, there was something, something that felt really uncomfortable when I tried to participate. And yet on an individual level, the people were loving and caring, but there was just something wrong with the, the, whole, the whole setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I get it. And uh, um, it, 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 it all boils down to interpretation. Um, mm -hmm. um, Uh, and for our purposes today, uh, as we study the impact of, or the, the compromises that faith practice has made with, uh, with regard to racism, it, it's the same as you're describing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's going the same direction. It's, it's frightening. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand how it got like that. I don't, I don't even, I think that people are projecting their own fears and their own narrow mindedness mm -hmm. and they're putting that back on the Bible. Well, let's, uh, yeah, well, let's, let's look at that question from the standpoint of, of his description of, of the uh, Southern strategy, um, because I think that shows how well, this whole thing can get distorted, um, which is what you're what you're ringing the, the bell for. You're you're saying, how did that happen? How how does how does that kind of oppression happen? Well, how does it happen? In how did it happen in the South, according to Tisby? The, he he used the Southern strategy that um, uh, Richard Nixon was the first one to be elected out of the Southern strategy. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, then uh, came along. Um, and then Reagan, um, and uh, so all of a sudden we have a Democratic South that has turned Republican, and still is to this day. Uh, you just look at the states. Uh, um, um, this past election, Georgia and Arizona were outliers, and you see where that's being led right now. So um, uh, speak to that. What What do you see as the uh, Southern strategy? Why? Why did that develop? Do you remember what he said about that? How, how did the Southern strategy develop? What, were, what, was, Amer what was America tired of? The attacking on Christian schools with Jimmy Carter? Yeah, that's, that's one thing. Well, that's, that, that came a little bit later, but yes, that's one thing that uh, uh, irritated people. He said they were tired of the civil rights movement. Yeah, uh, you know they, you know whatever rioting was going on, whatever uh, perceived uh, disorder and, and potential violence, they were just everybody was getting sick of it. Uh, largely, it was happening in the South, and so um, what did what did the um, what platform plank did they run on? Did, did Nixon run on that became a still to this day? Still to this day, uh, what is the plank that allows for racism to happen under a very nice, pleasant term that no one would agree, disagree with? Law and order. Law and order. Law and order. Did we see that in the last election? Um, you know, and who is it that's going to stand against law and order? But what is the law and order directed toward? 
and that's Tisby's case that that uh, we become complicit if we embrace law and order, but don't understand how how it impacts uh, the whole of of uh, of of our culture. Um, I remember what he said. Uh, what was the name of the guy? He he quoted very early on, uh, who died in 1991 at 40 years old. What was his name? Um, oh, rats. Anyway, he was, he was a young guy, and he he admitted that all they were doing is couching things in a different language, and if you do it, if you do it, and it's slick. It marginalizes people and they don't even know it because of the language you're using. Law and order. Is anybody on my view screen against law and order? No. You know, uh, this next one, the next one is uh, um, the, uh, uh, what do they call it with regard to the police now that they're trying to defund, defund the police. Nobody's going to defund the police. That's a much, that's a ridiculous concept. But the, you know, anytime you go to do police reform, it's gonna that's the language that's going to be used, and um, okay. that's not it's just not true. But it's a pleasant way to talk about it. And uh, so we'll go law and order. We're not going to defund the police, but we'll go we'll go law and order. It's, I've, I've read a little bit about the history of policing. And in fact, modern policing in the United States has elements of racism that it was, that the police force was basically to protect white people's property. And, uh, you know, I don't have a whole lot of details. Well, Tisby, that. Tisby made that, that case. Uh, who is behind the Southern strategy, did he say? white suburbanites who were anxious about their property. And so the way policing uh, uh, worked this out had to do with uh, um, how it was applied, particularly in uh, the uh, trafficking of drug, trafficking and use of drugs and how, how the prisons became a warehouse for, for the, uh, quite frankly, a largely black population. If you go to most any prison, you will see the percentages are way out of line, but that's the way policing uh, moved. Um, he also referenced the idea of the welfare queen, which automatically puts a, a, uh, a parenthesis about around who that person is or who these people are and it was designed to be a racial uh, judgment when in fact there are more white people on welfare than we even have a right to think about black being, being on welfare. But that's not how it's, it becomes pejorative and referenced to, uh, to race, racial uh, um, uh, understandings. So uh, he, again, I think the case that he's making here is how language the language has adapted so that racism is talked about in nice, polite ways. And we need to get underneath the nice, polite language in order to, uh, to grasp it. Um, so, um, what other pieces did you, did you make notes about? Um, I, I often think about, I wrote down about Bob Jones University being, saying that segregation was a religious belief of theirs. Mm -hmm. And, and. Um, That's not new, by the way. We saw that in, in past presentations where, where pastors would make clear pronouncements against segregation and then, of course, translate that into schools and everything else. So I'm sorry, Patrice, I just want to make sure this is. Bob Jones wasn't number one. Right. But that's, you know, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, my personal belief is that the law 
has to allow for people to have the freedom to do some things that you don't believe is the right way. Does, does that make sense? Like well, freedom faith, of expression? Well, our faith can teach us that um, whatever that you, or, you know, we can believe that Christian, being a Christian is the, the way, like Jesus is the way. But our law in our society has to allow for other religions to exist. And th that's a tough question. It is until, until the government subsidizes your university. <laughs> um, so that if you're going to embrace uh, positions that are outside of, of uh, positions the government has, has landed upon, then they have the right to withdraw their assistance uh, from from your practice um, so that uh, you know we don't have to yes I believe you're right freedom of expression I think is very real I, I think it gets warped especially when it goes immoral but uh, Bob Jones probably was not considered to be an immoral place but just one that embraced uh, positions that we don't agree on but when they begin to to uh, take advantage of uh, legal loopholes and uh, avoid taxation and, and all of the rest, then the government has a right to, I think, I think, to, to speak to that. So, but I understand the conundrum. I, I get that. What do you remember about the moral majority? Anybody uh, into that? Um, or is it you know, just kind of understood? Jerry Falwell and uh, Liberty Baptist, uh, now Liberty University, and it's a it's a major school <laughs> right now. Well, um, I don't want to prolong it if you if if there are pieces that you don't want to you know if. There are notes that you just don't consider as important right now. That's, that's fine. I don't want to prolong our time necessarily, but uh, I will say I do. I do have this um, little video that I have not previewed. I can't. I can't speak for its quality or its or the uh, how true it is, but um, it has to do with the Southern strategy because along with the Bebbington quadrilateral, I had not heard of what I would call Southern strategy. I, I see its fruit, I, I see its fruit, but I did not, I did not hear it being given a name. So if, if you'd like to see that, I'm happy to show it to you. If, if you don't want to see it, then you can sign off, but uh, I, I'm happy to offer it to you. It's about uh, just under 10 minutes long, so, so you know, okay? Want to see that? Okay. Sure. Let's see what we've got. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History, as we're gonna have a little bit of a poli side talk and get jiggy with what's called the Southern Strategy. Just a nice little talk. No pop up, no pop downs, no crazy nostalgic TV music. Except for that one, I'm gonna do that every time. I just wanna talk about it because if you're in an AP government class or a government class, you need to know it. And if you're a lifelong learner, you got an itch for the learning and I'm here to scratch it. 
That was creepy. So let's talk about the Southern strategy, which is a political strategy that's embraced by the Republican Party, really beginning in the 1950s, but big time in the 1960s and all the way up through the 1980s, and some people would argue today, in order to gain white Southern votes and also white suburban votes in the North. But uh, the two big words I'm going to use are dealignment and realignment. And in political science terms, that just simply means at certain points in American history, groups of people dealign from political party because that political party party stops representing their interests. And if the other party is smart, they'll do something to attract that group. And that's called realignment. So when we're talking about the Southern strategy, now I'm going to use the words in a sentence, we're talking about the dealignment of white Southern voters from the Democratic Party, and then realigning with the Republican Party. And that's kind of the way it is now for the most part. And of course, this is a broad statement, but the Democratic Party kind of represents more of the interests of the northern states and the Republican Party may be more of the southern states in a very broad way. That's opposite land of where we used to be. So, of course, if you know your history, you know the Democratic Party was born in the South. It's the party of Andrew Jackson. It's the party of slavery. It's going to be the party of Jim Crow. They're racists, right? That's what we're talking about. But yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, it's a party of populism. It's born out of kind of the anti-elitism, the fear of the big banks and the northerners and industry controlling big government. They're all about states' rights for economic reasons, but also maybe a little bit of the slavery as well. They don't want slaves being free and such, so they believe in this states' rights concept. So if you're a white southerner, you're definitely a Democrat. If it's before the Civil War and probably after, you're a Democrat. And the Northern Republican Party was founded by Abraham Lincoln, and it was founded on the idea of having a strong federal government, saving the Union, and eventually that's going to mean ending slavery. So if they're going to end slavery and give blacks the right to citizenship and the right to vote, and you're a white Southerner, you are not liking the Republican Party. So to have something happen where you're going to join that political party that fought you in the Civil War, we have to have a strategy. Something has to occur. So following Reconstruction, we could see right away the Republican Party, they have all these freed blacks that can vote for the Republican Party, but they're not going to focus on their issues. In fact, in 1868, when Grant ran, they only gave 5% of their war chest to Southern races. They weren't really interested in that. And in fact, as time goes on, they're going to give up on the South, and they're really just going to utilize the Republican Party of the South really for nominations for the president. Then they're going to concentrate in the North on getting votes, and that's going to allow those those white Democrats to coalesce and control the South. That's called the solid South. All through these elections, as you're seeing me flip them on the board or as you're seeing them in front of you right now, you can see that the Democratic Party always wins the South. They always win the South. We should also mention that this means the Republican Party, although they might be kind of uh, taking for granted these African Americans who belong to the party of Lincoln, they're the ones that for the most part are supporting civil rights. Even when we get to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, it was more Republicans that supported that than Democrats. But something occurs and it really happens in Texas in 1956. Now remember 1954 is a watershed year because that's Brown versus Board of Ed. That's gonna wake up white Southerners to the idea that change is a coming and you ain't going to like it, namely integration. So in 1956, something interesting happens, and it's a race in Texas, a congressional race based in Dallas. Bruce Alger was his name, and he had won in 1954 as a Republican in the South, but he was a moderate Republican. His stance on race was one of gradualism, like it's going to occur, let's work with the tides of change. And then he made a strategic change in 1956. And as a Republican, he ran as an avid segregationalist. And part of this wasn't because he had a change of heart, but was because there was a change in the community. And namely, this had to do with the first Baptist church in Dallas, which was run by a guy by the name of uh, W.A. Griswold. And this was a man who believed that the Bible uh, verified that we should be segregationalist. And the people in the communities ate this up. And this sends a message in Texas that this is the thing for the Republican Party to do. And then John Towers in 1961 becomes a senator all the way up to the 1980s in Texas. And he was an avid segregationalist as well. It worked for them. 
So now as we move into a national model, the Republican Party has probably taken notice that this worked in Texas. So first in 1964, LBJ is going to crush Barry Goldwater. Now, Barry Goldwater is not a racist, but Barry Goldwater is an avid ideologist, and he believes with all of his heart that states' rights is the way to go, that the Constitution should be read strictly, that we shouldn't have big government programs like Medicaid and Medicare, and we shouldn't have the federal government getting involved in elections and civil rights. That should be left to the people. Did I say not go for civil rights? I did. But that doesn't mean he was a racist. But in 1964, as you look at that map, Barry Goldwater gets crushed everywhere except for the Deep South. A Republican just won the Deep South. Got crushed everywhere else. But if there's a way, the Republican Party thinks to itself, to take advantage of this concept that his ideology got those racist votes and he wasn't racist, maybe we can come up with a strategy like that. And that's what Richard Nixon does in 1968, and he's pretty successful. Now, in 1968, as you look at that map, you can see that he doesn't win all of the South. We have uh, George Wallace running as an independent. He's still a Democrat, but he is D line creating an independent party, and he is sucking votes away from Richard Nixon. This shows you that those white Southerners, they do not want to vote for a Republican if they can help it but they're not gonna vote for a pro-civil rights Democrat either. So basically what we can boil this down to is that the Southern strategy is kind of using what's called dog whistle politics, where rather than saying racist things and being a racist, you appeal to the issues that appeal to the racists. So for instance, you talk about states' rights. Ronald Reagan, when he began his campaign, Ronald Reagan's not gonna say, he's not, I'm not saying he's a racist, but he begins his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi. This is where three uh, civil rights workers were murdered by the Klan. And he starts his campaign talking about states' rights in Philadelphia, Mississippi. That's kind of the idea of the Southern strategy. Now, Richard Nixon called it the silent majority. And he's not only appealing to these Southern whites with these issues, but also kind of urbanites and suburbanites that are white in the North as well, kind of the Archie Bunkers of the world. If you've never seen Archie Bunker, watch All in the Family. You're going to love it, kids, I'm telling you. So this Southern strategy, it might be about being against busing or being for tax cuts or for welfare cuts, things that appeal to the racist without saying racist things. So the way to best summarize this is to actually listen to the words of some of these campaign managers and strategists that used this strategy, the Southern strategy. And one of them was Lee Atwater. And he was kind of the bulldog of the Republican Party. He's kind of the brain behind the operation. And you can hear him right now talking about the Southern strategy. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigga, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than white. So when Richard Nixon is talking about the counterculture and how we need law and order, to Archie Bunker in the North, that means we have to, you know, make sure these kids aren't smoking dope on the street. But to that guy in Mobile, Alabama, who's a white Southerner, that means not letting these African Americans getting out of hand. He didn't have to be racist to say that, to appeal to the racist. So when Ronald Reagan says we need to go after the welfare queens, he didn't call out African American women in a racist way, really. But that's what white Southerners heard. At one point, it was said that Reagan was testing phrases. And when he referred to young black men on welfare, he at one time tried young bucks. That didn't work out very well. He changed it. You don't want to look like a racist. You don't want to sound like a racist. You probably aren't a racist, but you need those votes. And that's the idea of the Southern strategy. So what do you guys think? Do you think that the Republican Party actually did employ this Southern strategy? Was it subconsciously that did it? Were they doing it overtly? Was it a racist thing to do, a non-racist thing to do? Are they still doing it today? What do you guys think about politics? Why don't you leave it down in the comments below? I certainly didn't cover everything, but I just kind of want you to understand the idea of the Southern strategy 
and how white Southerners who de-aligned from the Democratic Party over civil rights realigned over issues like law and order, welfare reform, and states' rights to the Republican Party in the period of history from 1960 to the 1980s. All right, guys, there you go. I hope your brain's a lot bigger. If you haven't checked it out, you can see we have tons of videos. What are you waiting for? Tell all your friends. Go to subscribe to Hip Hughes History on YouTube or check us out at www.hiphughes.com. We can't wait for you to join the family of learning. And now I'm going to say it because I believe it with all of my heart, where attention goes, energy flows, and we'll see you guys next time that you press my buttons. That was fascinating. <laughs> and uh, I was just absolutely dumbfounded that this white guy said practically all, all the things that Tisby said, which, you know, when we go around, you like to have things verified, you know? Uh, and uh, so to see and hear that was, uh, was very meaningful to me, I hope for you. So, um, any, any comments or any, any uh, reactions to to uh, anything you heard. Do you know how, when he made that, when he recorded that? I do Was not it? know. Uh, and I just left him. Uh, let me see if I can grab history. Uh, if you'll just hold steady here. Um, um, uh, where is that? Um, Because I'm just thinking that in a recent few years, the racist talk is mo more overt. You know, mm -hmm. people are not hiding it. They're not coding their language as much. Yeah. It's, um, it's more upfront. Uh, 2017. Yeah, this was and and uh, if you want more of this guy, it looks like I'm going to poke around on him a little bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, here he has an article, Jim Crow explained, uh, 2.6 um, um, million views, uh, apartheid explained. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, and I don't even know where he's from, but his first offering that I just saw with you uh, is, uh, is, is interesting. Um, he comes across yeah. as a college professor talking college language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, I mean, it's a, um, <clears throat> I'm just poking around here. Um, um, conservatism explained um, there's some things, uh, the caning of Sumner, <laughs> uh, Senator Sumner, uh, 14th Amendment explained, the Johnson impeachment explained. So, you know, he's a historical, a political historian. And uh, uh, it, it, I'm going to poke around on him a little bit. I think I can get myself a good education about things. Uh, um, that I should know about, but don't. Um, here, here's a, uh, now it's not him, but uh, the Lee Atwater, a 1981 interview on the Southern strategy. Um, again, if you, that's a minute and 40 seconds if you wanna see it, but that's, you know, that's a reflection on his uh, infamous, uh, what do they call it, white code talk. <laughs> um, so, you know, I. Would you like to see that one? They said, you know, I don't, I don't want to use up your night. We're almost to 830. But uh, on the other hand, I don't think we can talk intelligently unless we, unless we, uh, you know, know some of these things. Um, so. Go for yeah. it. Okay. Um, Only a minute. <laughs> yeah, hang on here. I have to poke it um, and get it up. And then I have to get back on a share screen. Um, so be patient with me.
Share screen, layout order, share sound, share. Okay, here we go. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, in, yeah, now y'all aren't quoting me on this. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states rights and all that stuff and you're getting so abstract now you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites and subconsciously maybe that is part of it i'm not saying that but i'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded uh that, that we that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other uh you follow me because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing, uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never knew, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. All right. Um, it, it doesn't. Forgive me. Somebody else wants to talk here. We're not. So, um, however you cut it, um, it's as Tisby said. It just changes. It's uh, it just adapts. Um, and um, you know, as as a Southern strategy develops, I think uh, when they began to see. Uh, segregation win in Texas, automatically all eyes turn to Texas. And if it wins one in Texas, can it win where I am? And so let's try it. Let's run the experiment. And then so, you know, Republicans began to win in uh, as the Southern strategy developed. And the more they won, the more inclined they were to enter those practices. And uh, just like Atwater said, the language changed, but the results were the same. Frightening. Very frightening. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I hope uh, all of this is helpful to you. I, it's been helpful to me. I've gotten an education that I strongly needed and uh, hope that you have too and that when we depart, that your thought processes continue to churn. And uh, it's clear to me that all of you are um, reading beyond uh, what, we, uh, what we see and hear on the video presentation. And that, that is very pleasing to me. And I hope it continues. I hope it continues. Um, uh, Cindy and Don sent me a note, and I'm just going to reference this. Um, and forgive me. Um, what was the name of the organization you support that deals with um, uh, um, Southern Poverty Law Level? Okay, Southern Poverty LC. Okay, so that's an organization you may want to research, and uh, they are they are mainly involved in deciphering and discerning. Um, uh, what are the racist groups that are operational? Is that right? One of their primary My membership card, member since 1999. <laughs> okay. There we go. You have a you have a sister over here, uh, so um, so that's a uh, that's worth exploring uh, uh, as a uh, as they are a kind of a I won't we'll call them a watchdog organization, but they're certainly watching. Uh, watching raci racism as it unfolds. Um, well, they're also very practical. They do court cases, you know, mm -hmm. they litigate mm -hmm. and um, they've been doing that. Good. That's part of their focus. Good. 
that well, thank doesn't you. Well, it blow your mind when you see the number of hate crime reports and oh, yeah. through the FBI. I mean, it's legit. If you go online and research the FBI, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's like I had no clue. Mm-hmm. Well, that's true of most all of us. Uh, you know, the, the depth of all of this is beyond our ability to to comprehend until you get conscious about it and and uh, say, "I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna rise up and do something now." So, so to those of you who have joined, uh, thanks for rising up. Uh, well, the Sunday newspaper this April the fourth. There is an article, We Can Make a Better York. It's Your Turn by Bill Swartz. And it says about learning about establishing a countywide human relations committee to fight discrimination in all its forms in York County. And one of our church members is a York commissioner. (laughs) So... (laughs) I think it's something we should keep track of and look into and because I definitely think we need to do something in York. Yeah. Um, I wonder if it would be helpful for us to write a letter with, with our signatures upon it to, uh, to uh, send that to Ron and the, and the other commissioners. So. Uh, to say, you know, this is, it's time to be serious about this. Um, Time to be serious about a lot of things, but this this is important. Um, Yes. um, Can I ask Cindy, could you, could you put together a letter? I don't want to just dump it on you and, and, but I'm going to. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Could you uh, compose a, a letter with regard to that article and um, maybe uh, send it to me and I'll email it to all of our participants and um, you know and then we'll we'll uh, quibble over it and say uh, you know we could make it stronger here or or I don't agree with this you know you just give us some foundation from which to operate and then if we like what we've uh, composed then we'll all sign it and send it to uh, send it to somebody it's something something we can do okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay, let's pray our way home. One of the things that we love most about the Christian life is that you have encouraged us to be lifelong learners. And when we don't know something that matters, as we see our our society unfold and injustices impact the widow, the orphan, and the races, that you you call us to learn and then to, to react and to struggle, enter the struggle for social justice and perhaps even, even to endure suffering in the fight. We pray, oh God, that you would inspire us to continue our study so that we will become equipped to do our best to stand against that which which has disenfranchised the whole race of people. And as we think about the history of of black folks in our in our culture, suddenly the the uh, the same thing has happened with Asian Americans, and we. We regret and lament what we're learning about, about all of that. And suddenly a new area of concern rises up. But you call us to meet those moments and we, we pray that this is a beginning place and we start here so that we can move ahead in, in other ways. Thank you for these friends who are in the journey And we pray that the journey will bear fruit. And we do so in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. I really love you all. I'm so happy to to be around here every week. Yeah. Well, uh, now I know we have a couple of, uh, what is a Southern law 
Southern Poverty Law Center. Okay. All right. Be good, everyone. Until we meet again. Bye. Bye.